So hello, my name is Erin Moran and I'm the Clinic Partnership Manager here at the MAVEN Project. Thank you all for joining us today for COPD, Understanding the New Gold Guidelines with Dr. Daniel Ray. All right. So we, we were just chatting before we made the introduction about the, the frustration that we all have um, figuring out which inhalers to order for which patient based on their insurance formula, et cetera. Unfortunately, that's the one thing I'm really not going to help you address. Uh, I can give you classes of drugs to order, but not the actual inhaler. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, COPD. There's some recent changes to gold guidelines, although much of it is uh, similar to what you've probably been used to. Um, let's see if I can advance this. No, I can't. All right, there we go. Um, our objectives today, one is to get uh, an understanding of spirometry in establishing a diagnosis of COPD. We want to understand that there are a lot of treatments that are non-pharmacologic that are helpful in COPD. Um, there are a few updates to the gold guidelines that we'll go over. Uh, that ABCE classifications have been changed. Now it's ABE. Um, and the, as in the previous guidelines, the use of inhaled corticosteroids in COPD has been tailored, has been dialed back. And there are very specific circumstances that we will consider using uh, inhaled corticosteroids um, in a small group of our COPD patients. And then we want to look at what happens if our patient's complaining of worsening dyspnea and, or having an exacerbation, when to order home oxygen therapy, and then if I have more time, we'll go over uh, the evidence behind some of these guidelines. Uh, just uh, a little bit of the um, uh, etiology and, and um, uh, pathogenesis of COPD. So uh, as we're growing up, our lungs are getting bigger and bigger to about age 18 or thereabouts. And then our, our lung volumes are pretty fixed for a number of years until we get older. And then there's this gradual decline, as you can see, over time. Uh, not very much. It doesn't affect our, our normal functioning. Uh, unfortunately, if we grow up and start smoking cigarettes, uh, are exposed to lots of pollution, uh, then there's a faster decline in our lung function, and it can become significant and affect our, our function. The, um, but you can get the, down here at lower lung volume and uh, reserve it, by other means, and one is that your lungs may not fully develop as you grow. Uh, so preterm infants, uh, kids with lots of respiratory infections, uh, kids exposed to a lot of pollution in the house, smokers in the house, for example, their lungs may not fully develop. So they're starting at a lower lung volume and they don't have to fall as far uh, before they become uh, affected by chronic obstructive lung disease. So something to consider. The, there are a bunch of different types of COPD, um, although the vast majority, as you know, are related to cigarette smoking. Uh, nowadays, there are some people who smoke a lot of cannabis. Uh, that's just as bad as smoking cigarettes. Um, patients that you have that have grown up um, in parts of the world where they, they still do wood fires and biomass, they burn biomass, uh, that exposure to household pollution can cause COPD-like changes. Um, Probably the, the second largest group of COPD patients are the ones that have this uh, crossover between asthma and COPD. So these would be patients uh, that had asthma as a child, they outgrew it, and of course, then they started smoking. And uh, you know by age 50, they're having a lot of trouble breathing, and you measure, and they have fixed obstruction. Um, so that this is this crossover of COPD and asthma. There are a very tiny number of patients, far less than 1%, that have alpha-1 antitrypsin. So um, and they characteristically present uh, at a younger age, say 50, uh, with fixed obstruction and uh, emphysematous changes at the lung bases. Um, so if you have somebody that's uh, presenting relatively young with uh, changes of COPD, and particularly if they have a family history of COPD, 
Um, you may want to consider checking an alpha-1 antitrypsin level. Uh, and then we talked about um, these uh, people that don't develop full lung volumes uh, by the time they're adults. So this would include premature birth, low um, um, childhood respiratory infections. Um, and then, as always, there's an unknown cause um, uh, for COPD. Uh, things that we want to consider, uh, diagnosis with COPD, the, uh, most patients have dyspnea as their primary uh, symptom. So it's slow, it's progressive over time, it's worse with exercise, and it's always there. That kind of differentiates a little bit uh, from asthma. They may also have wheezing or a chronic cough, and that can be productive or non-productive. Uh, more respiratory infections, or they always get respiratory infections, take a, a long time to recover. So if you have one of these symptoms, primarily dyspnea, and you have risk factors, so smoke exposure, uh, occupational dust, fumes, vapor exposure, um, then you have a presumptive diagnosis of COPD, but the way you establish that diagnosis is by spirometry. So uh, spirometry is, you have to have an abnormal spirometry, fixed obstruction to, uh, to con confirm a diagnosis of COPD. So what does that mean? That means the FEV1 to FVC ratio is less than 0.7 after bronchodilators. So if you get a patient, you're suspicious they might have COPD, you do spirometry, their ratio is 0.6, you give them a bronchodilator, you repeat the spirometry, the ratio is 0.6, uh, then you confirm the diagnosis of COPD. Um, you can also use the spirometry to grade their level of obstruction. For that, we use the FEV1. Um, and you can, in subsequent visits, you can repeat the spirometry to assess for progression of the disease or a change in their symptoms. This is the, the classic uh, loops that you'll see uh, with spirometry. You have the patient take a full breath in, exhale as hard and fast as they can, and keep exhaling, keep exhaling, keep exhaling. Most of the time, in a normal patient, they will plateau at about two seconds, and no more air comes out of their chest. Uh, their ratio is going to be about 0.8. Um, and this would be an average-sized male with an FEV1 of four liters and, um, uh, and a normal spirometry. With COPD, as you can see, as they're exhaling, less air is coming out over time, and it's taking much longer to empty their lungs so that they may plateau at five, six seconds. In fact, you can hear this. Um, if you put your stethoscope on the patient, have them exhale as hard as they can, you may still hear wheezing after five, six seconds uh, listening to their chest. Uh, in this case, the ratio is less than 0.7, the FEV1 and FVC ratio, uh, and their uh, force vital uh, capacity in one second, 1.8 liters, is severely reduced. So, like I said, you can use the FEV1, the percent predicted, to grade the level of obstruction, so mild obstruction with an FEV1 percent predicted of 80 or higher, moderate 50 to 80, and se severe obstruction is less than 50% and very severe less than 30%. Um, and there are patients walking around with this. It's uh, pretty amazing. They don't walk fast, but they're still at it. Uh, one thing to note is that we don't use the level of obstruction uh, to um, uh, to um, make a, a decision about their pharmacologic treatment. So we use symptoms and exacerbations to uh, for uh, determining their pharmacologic treatment. We use just the level of obstruction more as a, a way of categorizing this. And then some things like uh, pulmonary rehab uh, are only allowed with moderate or more obstruction. It's not, uh, 
they don't uh, pay for it with model obstruction. So the, as I said, the therapeutic decisions are mostly based on the patient's symptoms. There are a variety of ways to, to grade this. This is the Medical Research Council in Britain, um, has a simple scale. And it kind of divides right here, uh, right between grade one and grade two. So if a person is getting shorter breath with level walking, uh, then that's a grade two. And they're, that means they're moderately affected. Uh, if they're only getting shorter breath when they're hurrying, they're racing to catch the bus, they're walking up a, a hill, that's grade one. And then it can obviously get worse. You have patients that are severely affected and uh, it's really limiting their uh, ability to do things in the house, including getting dressed. There's a more nuanced um, uh, measurement which is the CPD assessment task, which judges both the level of obstruction as well as how it kind of affects them. So for example, they describe whether they have energy or not, whether they're sleeping soundly or not, whether they're coughing up mucus or not, uh, in addition to the level of their shortness of breath. So either one of these tests work well, and then you put it all together with your um, spirometry. So your spirometry shows they have obstruction. Their FEV1 to FEC ratio is less than 0.7. Um, you've graded them, say their FEV1% predicted is 50%, so they're gold two. Um, but your uh, assessment of their symptoms and their exacerbations are what you're going to uh, uh, use to decide on therapy. So we have our patient here that's able to walk on level ground without um, uh, severe short or without significant shortness of breath, but they get short of breath climbing up hills. Um, and they have only had one flare up in their condition over the last year, they would be grade A. If they uh, have more symptoms, so they're getting short of breath with level walk or they're getting short of breath doing things around the house, uh, and they've had uh, one or less flare-up, that's grade D. And then finally, the patients that are having exacerbations, two or more uh, exacerbations in a year, or, or just one exacerbation that's put them in the hospital. So E for exacerbations, that, that's group E. So groups A, B, and E. And then as I said, we base our therapeutic treatments on their grade A, B, or E. So for our grade A patients, any bronchodilator will do. So this could be a, for people that have minimal symptoms, if any, this would be uh, a short-acting bronchodilator like albuterol uh, or atrovent. Um, if they have more persistent symptoms, you probably should go ahead and give them a long-acting bronchodilator. You can give them um, long-acting uh, beta agonists, a long-acting muscarinic antagonist. You can even give them the combination inhaler. Whatever is uh, cheapest on their formulary some, and something they're capable of using. Once the patient is having more symptoms, they need to be on a lava-lama combination. Combinations are always better than a single inhaler in terms of uh, the uh, both the improvement in the patient's symptoms and decrease in uh, morbidity and mortality. And then finally, for groups that are having multiple exacerbations, they uh, need to be on a combination, lava lama. And then we begin to consider whether or not they need inhaled corticosteroids. Um, and so that's a more nuanced decision. So that we tend to look at whether they have an elevation in blood eosinophils. So it's a definitive yes if they have blood eosinophils greater than 300, but it's not clear if they, or it's not as clear if they have blood eosinophils between 100 and 300, um, and they're and not having lots of exacerbations. So this is an in-between group. 
if you can avoid inhaled corticosteroids and they're doing okay, fine. If, if they're having more than one moderate exacerbation per year and they have eosinophils, say 200, um, you may want to go ahead and add that to their combination lava llama. Um, the people that you should not be giving inhaled corticosteroids to are the ones that have had repeated pneumonias. So there's good evidence that inhaled corticosteroids and COPD increases the frequency of pneumonia. Or if they have a history of atypical mycobacterial infection, so you'll have that tree and bud pattern in your CT scans, and they'll have a uh, cough and it's productive, and the sputum is positive for MAI, uh, those people probably should not be on an inhaled corticosteroid. And then if they just don't have a significant uh, blood eosinophil count, they probably should not be on inhaled corticosteroids. So the group to treat with adding uh, inhaled corticosteroids to your combination lava llama are the ones with blood eosinophils greater than 300. If they have that crossover COPD asthma, uh, if they're having multiple exacerbations in a year or a history of hospitalization. So any of these things minus these two things um, would be caused for adding the inhaled corticosteroid to the uh, long-acting beta agonists and long-acting muscarinic antagonists. So you now have this triple combination of which there are a couple of inhalers out there. They're incredibly expensive. You can um, run a lean on your house to pay for it. Um, but um, like uh, all our inhalers, uh, a single use inhaler, once a day inhaler, uh, it improves compliance uh, tremendously. So if it's all at all possible, uh, the patient should be on a single combination inhaler. So Put it all together and you have this you know big flow chart for management which you already we've just gone through you take the patient's symptoms their risk factors you do spirometry you find out yeah they are obstructed you can categorize their obstruction you do a symptom score uh, using the cat or the mrc test uh, along with the frequency of their exacerbations and based on their gold abe status you pick out which inhalers you're going to use. And then, of course, you're gathering other information. You're looking, are they still smoking? Because if they are, we, you're going to try to help them quit. Uh, should we consider alpha-1 antitrypsin? Are they young? Do they have this weird distribution of emphysematous changes in their lung? Uh, have a strong family history? Then check in alpha-1 antitrypsin. Uh, we're going to manage their comorbidities. So they all act together. They have heart failure, diabetes, you know, they... Um, those things can be, managing those can also help with the COPD. Um, obviously, we're going to offer the vaccinations to these patients, encourage active lifestyle. Um, we're going to check their inhaler technique. So if there's uh, one thing that you can do that will help your patient is to tirelessly check and recheck their inhaler technique. So... These inhalers, um, while it seems simple enough, but they're misused or uh, used incorrectly um, uh, frequently. And then of course the patient thinks that they don't work and they don't use them or uh, they use them and they're not getting the full effect. So, um, and unfortunately each of the inhalers has slightly different techniques. So you have to actually be in the room or your assistant has to be in the room um, and have the patient demonstrate uh, their inhaler technique uh, in front of them so that you can see that they're using it correctly. And if they're not, then you can um, re-instruct them in how it's used. And then it's worthwhile, and I used to do this, is to have the patient bring their inhalers with them, and then in front of me, I would have them use their inhaler uh, just so I could see that they were still using it correctly. Frequently, they would leave the office on one visit using it right and come back the next visit and not use it right. So, um, and then as we were having our discussion before the talk started, uh, because of the cost of these medications, uh, in, uh, patients often will be cutting back on 
their use of the inhaler. So you ask them, are they using the inhaler? They will gladly answer, yes, sure, doc, I'm using it. But they're only using it half the time uh, because they need to extend the inhaler for another month because they can't afford to buy another one uh, or pay for the house or pay for the groceries. So you have to make sure they're using it and using it uh, as you have prescribed. Uh, when you bring them back, you go through all the, the things again, whether they're still smoking, have they had exacerbations, you go over their uh, technique, and then you make adjustments. Um, two things that will come up frequently with your patients. Um, um, so patients um, that have COPD may come to you and say that their, their breathing is getting worse. Um, uh, they're not in a full-fledged exacerbation, but they just can't do as much. They get more short of breath walking to the mailbox or something of that nature. If they're on a single inhaler, like a, a lava, then obviously you can increase it to a combination inhaler and see if that helps. Um, you always, again, check their their um, inhaler technique and whether they're using it to the full dose. Uh, if they're coming to you with a flare-up, they're having an acute worsening of their breathing uh, and they're on a single inhaler, then they're going to you're going to want to have them on a combination inhaler. And also, if their blood eosinophils are greater than 300, you're going to add an inhaled corticosteroid, so a triple combination. Um, if their blood eosinophils are greater than 100, uh, you can try that as well. Uh, but if their blood eosinophils are less than 100, then you have... Um, other anti-inflammatories that you should be using as opposed to adding an inhaled corticosteroid. So what are those other anti-inflammatories? Well, there's the phosphodiesterase inhibitor, so uh, reflumalas, uh, and that uh, works best for your patients with severe obstruction and chronic bronchitis uh, or chronic antibiotic therapy. So Monday, Wednesday, Friday, azithromycin, 500 milligrams, um, uh, often works well. And these patients that are having multiple exacerbations, they don't have eosinophils. Um, and you can do this. The caveat to that is that it can affect their hearing because cause uh, a decrease in hearing that's permanent or tinnitus. So um, if you're going to start azithromycin chronically, so Monday, Wednesday, Friday for six months or for a year, uh, you should want to test their hearing to start with, retest it in three months and again in six months, and the, make sure the patient is aware of this potential side effect and to call you in, uh, at the first sign of a change in their hearing. The other non-pharmacologic things that you can do, uh, clearly smoking cessation is the one thing that if you accomplish that, then you've done this patient a world of good. Um, and we'll go over that in just a second. But there can be a lot of other things in their environment that are uh, affecting their breathing. Um, so you should ask about, do they have a wood-burning uh, stove in their house or in one of those wood-burning heaters? Um, you know, and is there any way that they, you know, that can be changed? If they're, if they have gas stoves, ideally they shouldn't be cooking over it. Or if they are, that they should be running the hood uh, to uh, vent the kitchen. Um, uh, and the most common um, problem, of course, is that there are other smokers in the house. So if, that if they're able to avoid that, I know it's incredibly difficult. Um, uh, they don't have the resources to do that. But in terms of quitting smoking, um, there are many techniques to get to this. The 
I like the five A's. You ask the patient, are they smoking? Uh, if they are, you tell them they have to quit smoking. Um, uh, you say, are we ready? Can we pick a quit date? Uh, so you're assessing their willingness to quit. Some patients will tell you, nope, sorry, doc, I'm just not doing that. Um, if they're ready to quit, uh, you can assist them. So adjuvant therapies actually improve the quit rates by about 10 or 15%. Uh, most of the time, I just start with trying to get them in a group where they, you know, uh, that where they can be supported. Um, but uh, nicotine gum, uh, you can use um, uh, Chantex or Zyban, uh, although those do have other side effects. So generally, I reserve that for patients that have tried multiple times. Uh, and finally, um, and most importantly, actually, is arrange for follow up because. This is a long process. Uh, almost nobody quits the first time around. Uh, they have to quit and try and then restart and quit and restart. And um, But at some point, uh, the majority of people quit. Um, if you ask uh, my COPD patients, they've almost all quit smoking. Um, so vaccines are obviously important. And it's the same evidence for uh, an older population, COPD. So uh, they should get the flu vaccine, COVID vaccine, uh, the pneumonia vaccine, the, the uh, PCD20 now. Um, if they if you can't get that, then you can do the combination of the uh, uh, 15 valent or 23 valent. Um, well, actually, it's 13 valent here and 23 valent. Um, pneumococcal vaccine, um, and then the new RSV vaccine. Um, so uh, should be recommended for individuals over 60. And then uh, finally, uh, they should be getting a Tdap at some point in their life um, uh, after age 50. So uh, inhaler technique, we talked about, it's really important. Uh, and this is the part that I can't help you with. Um, everybody's formulary is different. Um, the costs are huge and a, a really important part of, of compliance. So however you can get the cheapest medicine for your patients, probably going to affect their ability to use it. Um, uh, although, as I said, ideally, uh, uh, once a day use or a single inhaler uh, will also improve your compliance. And then the second thing is their technique. Uh, and a caveat to that is that patients with severe, severe obstruction uh, often can't generate uh, the necessary flow uh, to activate the dry powder inhalers. So if they have um, FEV1s that are uh, well under a liter, uh, downwards of like 600 milliliters, uh, they often just can't use the, the new dry powder inhalers because they can't, and it can't generate enough flow to actually pull the powder in. Um, they would need to be on nebulizer treatments or, or um, the aerosol-driven inhalers. Um, two other things that uh, have shown to improve mortality in COPD, non-pharmacologic things. One is oxygen. Um, strong evidence that patients that are chronically hypoxic at rest, at rest, not with exercise, not intermittently while they're sleeping, just saturations less than 88% sitting quietly, uh, those people benefit from oxygen. Um, if you walk them around the office and they desaturate, but sitting quietly, their sats are 92%, they won't benefit from oxygen. Um, and you will, if you prescribe it, which you could, um, the, unfortunately there's this dichotomy between the evidence and what um, uh, Medicare will pay for. Um, you will just saddle them with this uh, needless therapy that will further limit their ability to do things and to exercise. Um, and the other thing that you may not be as aware of, but patients with chronic hypercapnia, um, 
can benefit uh, from this uh, non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. So um, basically it's like um, CPAP uh, at night, not so much for sleep apnea, but actually to, um, uh, to bring down their uh, carbon dioxide levels. So there's uh, reasonable evidence for this. Uh, severe hypercapnia. So these typically these are patients with PCO2s in the 60s, and hospitals, you know, frequent hospitalizations for disease. Uh, they would become a candidate for this. The pulmonologist uh, should be ordering this, uh, but just be aware that that's a therapy shown to benefit uh, and decrease mortality. So we talked about oxygen therapy. It's really only one number you need to know, which is saturation is less than 88%, those people should be on oxygen, and that's sitting quietly. There's this little caveat for uh, saturations from 88% to 90% if they have right heart failure or erythrocytosis, um, that would qualify them. But otherwise, just less than 88%, and you titrate to saturations greater than 90%, and you reassess at three months. You're actually required to reassess at three months. Um, hospice care can help uh, these patients, uh, not because they die uh, soon, <laughs> they, especially nowadays. Uh, we used to intubate patients with COPD that came in with severe exacerbations and respiratory failure and uh, we we'll almost never do now that we can do it non-invasively with the mass um, and you know, get them through that uh, exacerbation and back home. And then they come back to the hospital for another one. And um, just, you know, time after time, year after year, we're back and forth uh, from the hospital to home. Um, so, and in fact, they've actually uh, found that's one of the reasons that uh, lung transplantation for uh, emphysema uh, does not actually improve uh, mortality compared to the control group, which is just good care of your uh, patient with COPD. Um, so, but obviously, since, since you'll be seeing this patient a lot, they're, they're going to have lots of problems, so you're going to be seeing them a lot you'll have many chances to kind of slowly talk about uh, what, they, what they want uh, when the time comes. So I would start that conversation and, does, um, and at some point, if you know, when they, they've achieved whatever goals they want in life and you know, it's becoming too hard and they don't want to go back to the hospital, you know, then, and they tell you uh, they don't want to go back, then it's probably, it's time for hospice care. Um, Opiates can help uh, these patients. Uh, it obviously, it helps relieve some of the that um, uncomfortable uh, air hunger that they experience. The other thing, actually, which we often use with uh, exacerbations, is to have air blowing over the patient. So a bedside fan, uh, those little portable battery ones that you clip on, uh, are quite helpful. And then finally, uh, lung cancer um, is a big risk in these patients. Um, so if you take all smokers, um, 20 pack years plus, I think the lifetime risk for the development of lung cancer is about 4%, but it's higher, uh, actually significantly higher in patients with COPD. Uh, so if you've got a, a COPD patient age greater than 55 years, smoking history greater than actually in, now it's 20 pack years, um, they, and any of these other things as well, uh, they're at risk for lung cancer and they should be getting uh, annual low dose CT a lung cancer screening test. Um, they qualify for that. So, um, your patients, you, like I said, you'll be seeing them frequently. So, you know them well, um, uh, they're going to have exacerbations. Um, uh, most of the time, it's just going to be a, a viral infection triggering their COPD. Sometimes it's a, a exposure to more smoke or pollution. 
as we've had recently. Um, and then uh, occasionally, you know, superimposed bacterial infections. Um, but there are other things that can uh, mimic a COPD exacerbation. So you should always consider these as you're uh, examining, talking to your patient. Um, and one is pneumonia. So patients with COPD develop pneumonia. Uh, it can manifest more as dyspnea than it cough or fever. Uh, and obviously you can do a chest radiograph if you're suspicious of that, your crackles on one side, not the other, um, that you're going to want to take a look at. Pulmonary embolism, particularly in the right setting, um, say they've had recent surgery and now they're having a COPD exacerbation. Well, maybe it's not, maybe it's they're having a pulmonary embolism. Uh, patients with chronic heart failure, um, the, again, worsening dyspnea, they may not have anything else. Um, and it can, you can have patients with COPD that have also heart failure. So that's a, again, chest X-ray will help your brain, um, the uh, BNP level. Um, and then less frequent, but I've seen both of these is the um, patient with COPD presenting with a quote COPD exacerbation that has a spontaneous pneumothorax or they're coming in with new onset atrial fibrillation, or they've had a, a small heart attack. So um, these are kind of in your differential uh, diagnosis for uh, an exacerbation of COPD. And then when your patients uh, are coming in complaining of an acute worsening, uh, their shortness of breath, they're struggling to breathe, They've got a diminishment in oxygen saturation, confusion, drowsiness. They should probably go to the hospital. Obviously, you're looking for acute on chronic respiratory failure. If they've got peripheral cyanosis, they've got new edema. Uh, let's say you had started out treating them as a, an outpatient exacerbation with some steroids and using their nebulizer, but they're not getting better. Um, or they've got uh, comorbidities that make their care more complicated. So uh, including uh, nobody at home to help them uh, be all good reasons to send them um, to the hospital. Uh, and then for those that you're managing in the office, not sending them to the hospital, uh, you're going to want to start using short-acting bronchodilators combinations, so uh, short-acting beta agonists, short-acting muscarinic antagonists. Uh, oftentimes, uh, we do this with nebula frequent nebulizer treatments, but an inhaler works just as well if the patient is able to use it correctly. Um, then kind of the cornerstone of uh, treating these acute exacerbations is a short course of oral corticosteroids. So prednisone, uh, 40 milligrams for five days. Don't need to taper, just um, if they're going to improve, it'll be because you gave them that short course steroids. The antibiotics, uh, if you have the a bacterial infection or you suspect a bacterial infection, uh, they can receive antibiotics. Uh, again, short course. So the, if they have fevers, uh, if they have purulent sputum, new purulent sputum, if they have uh, an increase in sputum. So any one of those three signs um, in the face of uh, an exacerbation of their COPD, um, they should receive a short course of uh, oral antibiotics. And then on our patients with hypercapnia, then we talked about um, using this non-invasive uh, ventilation. So um, the key evidence of, is supporting uh, um, corticosteroids, uh, shortened time, recovery time, hospital duration. We talked about five days for uh, steroids. Same thing with antibiotics. Um, reduce early relapse, treatment failure, hospitalization duration. Again, five days, short course. Um, the 
we don't use uh, theophylline anymore. Um, in the acute setting, uh, you may have a few patients that are on it chronically. Um, and then uh, you're not going to do this in the office. If they have uh, this at home, they might, and they haven't been using it, You, they could potentially use it. But this is going to be something uh, that's going to happen in the hospital. All right. We've made it through, and you now are experts in the treatment of COPD. Uh, I'll just briefly run through uh, some of the, uh, the data that's behind these recommendations, uh, uh, both for pharmacologic treatments and non-pharmacologic treatments. Um, so the triple combination inhalers, a LABA, LAMA, and inhaled corticosteroid, they're two big randomized controlled trials that showed uh, an improvement in uh, overall mortality. Um, and these were in patients that had history of frequent uh, and or severe exacerbations. So um, there's, this is strong evidence to use triple combination in therapy, patients with frequent and or severe exacerbations. Non-pharmacologic, um, Treatments that have an effect on mortality uh, include smoking cessation, pulmonary rehabilitation. So these are patients hospitalized for exacerbations. If you them through pulmonary rehab, it, it actually improves their overall mortality. We talked about oxygen therapy for patients uh, with um, severe resting hypoxemia. And then non-invasive positive pressure ventilation um, in patients with uh, marked hypercapnia. And then we haven't talked about this, but uh, in a very select group of patients uh, that have upper lobe emphysema and extremely low exercise capacity, i.e. They, they flunk pulmonary rehab and they have blebs and bulli filling the, the upper uh, lung spaces. Uh, those patients actually benefit from lung volume reduction surgery. Um, the evidence for use of bronchodilators in COPD. Uh, so one, bronchodilators, any bronchodilator helps in COPD. Um, short-acting bronchodilators help. Combination of short-acting bronchodilators helps more than a single short-acting bronchodilator. Same thing with long-acting bronchodilators. They help, and combinations help more than a single uh, long-acting bronchodilator. So um, more is better uh, in terms of bronchodilation. Um, you can, or people have used uh, theophylline. We, we rarely use it now, but uh, it does work um, in, um, in lower doses. And anti-inflammatory therapy. So we, we went over the evidence that addition of an inhaled corticosteroid in patients that are having a frequent or severe exacerbations and have an elevated eosinophil level, uh, those patients benefit from inhaled corticosteroids. Uh, Long-term uh, oral glucocorticoids, so putting somebody on five milligrams of prednisone forever uh, has... Uh, no evidence of benefits, um, and it has lots of side effects. So you may have patients that you've inherited that have been on prednisone forever, uh, and good luck ever trying to get them off of it because as you taper, they'll feel worse and have flare-ups. But um, in terms of starting patients on it, that's is, I would leave that to the pulmonologist, and very few patients now are on chronic oral corticosteroids. Uh, we talked about uh, the PD-4 inhibitors in patients with uh, severe obstruction, chronic bronchitis, chronic antibiotic therapy, uh, another uh, has good evidence behind it for treatment of um, uh, uh, severe COPD and multiple exacerbations. Um, there is actually some evidence that um, mucolytic agents in Take the patients that have uh, uh, 
daily productive coughs is helpful, um, but no other anti-inflammatory agents. And for a while, there was a rage about stat statins and COPD, and that's been disproven. Um, other things that you can do, obviously, for patients that are deficient, alpha-1 and trypsin augmentation therapy can help. Uh, Antitussives, no evidence of benefit. Vasodilators, no evidence of benefit. Pulmonary hypertensive therapy, no evidence of benefit. And then opiates, it, it can improve dyspnea in patients with severe disease. Uh, the other things that your pulmonologist would be considering, lung volume reduction surgery, bolectomies, uh, transplantation, which we, I, I think I told you before, really has no long-term mortality benefit over just standard treatment of COPD. Um, there are now these new bronchoscopic techniques that are, uh, that are kind of like lung volume reduction surgery, only internal. Um, the placement of one-way uh, bronchial valves, uh, lung coils, or vapor ablation of airways leading out to uh, huge emphysematous spaces in the lung. So all these seem to help, uh, although the numbers of these patients are relatively small compared to like the drug trials. And then at the end of the, uh, your slide set, you'll have this COPD follow-up checklist if you don't already use something, you might want to use that. It just kind of covers the standard stuff we talked about, how there's their symptoms, their dyspnea, their cough, which inhalers they're on, you know, have they had their vaccines, do they have an action plan, you know, um, their environment, uh, activities, et cetera. Um, so I'm happy to take questions now. Hope the group has some questions. The uh, uh, Usually, or if you have a patient you're working with that you have, like, see if we can stump Dr. Ray, which won't take very much. Yeah, absolutely. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to raise your hand and I can unmute you or you can just submit them directly into the Q&A box. Thank you for your great talk, Dr. Ray. Um, I was wondering, you, you mentioned nebulizers um, a little bit, and I wonder if you've experienced, since it's covered under a different part of Medicare, if um, if perhaps those, are, those can be more affordable in different formulations. I have only ever been able to use the um, short-acting beta agonists like albuterol and ipratropium. But I wonder if there's any movement towards long-acting um, agents as nebulizers. They, they do have long-acting agents now. Um, but um, as you pointed out, they're not covered. So, and they're very expensive. So unfortunately for um, most patients, it's not, uh, it's not useful. That, and in fact, the nebulizer itself is really not useful except for a very select group of patients, the ones that just cannot manage an inhaler because their their breathing is so bad they can't or you know they can't uh, master the technique despite <laughs> multiple attempts. But even there, you're putting them at a disadvantage. These are obviously these are short acting medicines, you know, albuterol and hypotropium. The um, so the patient's going to be tied to their nebulizer, you know, four or five times a day. It's a terrible uh, thing. So I, ideally we try to stay away from it uh, um, because it was paid for and inexpensive. A lot of patients ended up with these and use them, um, but they would benefit uh, from switching over to long acting uh, inhalers um, rather than using short acting medication. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ray. So there is, there are a few questions in the chat. The mm -hmm. first question is, I inherited a patient on theopiline. Uh -huh, I, check, I check levels every six months, but other than that, is there anything else I can monitor? If we decide to stop, do I wean off or stop abruptly? 
he continues to have frequent exacerbations with asthma slash COPD. So if he's having continued frequent exacerbations, I would probably continue it, assuming that the patient's not having any side effects, which doesn't sound like. We, we normally were aiming for levels so that, you know, the cutoff level is 20. People sometimes can get toxic a little bit less than that. They can lower seizure threshold and things of that nature. Uh, but we would aim for levels of about eight, six to eight. Um, and seem to get just the same amount of benefit uh, at these lower levels. The um, and it it is beneficial. So in the patients where I tried weaning off, I would they would frequently have more exacerbations and want to go back on the medicine because they were better off on it than off it. Um, so I would probably leave them on it unless there were some reason not to. Uh, if you are worried about toxicity, uh, you're studying medicine that interacts, um, then yes, I would wean them down, you know, have the dose and for a month and then, and then take them off. Um, and just, yeah, it's going to be hard to differentiate, you know, are they getting worse because we stopped at the offline or is it, you know, just a de novo exacerbation. Okay, thank you. Next question is, patients on combination hypertrop slash albuterol via NEB warnings pop up when a LAMA is prescribed. Is this drug interaction significant? Uh, no, so that happens a lot, right? It, it's like, can you over-treat the person uh, with a LAMA um, if you got short-acting and long-acting? So uh, I, if they're getting, you know, uh, if they're using their nebulizer with the combination uh, uh, short-acting beta agonist, uh, short-acting uh, muscarinic antagonist, then they, they probably shouldn't be on a long-acting um, uh, muscarinic antagonist. Um, so what you would do in that circumstances is, is stop the combination nebulizer and just use albuterol PRN and put them on you know, a combination long-acting beta agonist, long-acting muscarinic antagonist inhaler. Okay, thank you. The next question is, what antibiotics do you generally prescribe in the case of an acute exacerbation with concern of underlying bacterial infection? Um, well, azithromycin was pretty standard medicine. Uh, uh, Augmentin would work fine. Uh, and if those are too expensive, then, you know, you can use um, amoxicillin. Okay, thank you. And then I see Dr. Mazzillo has a question about humidification. Um, I don't know, Dr. Mazzillo, do you want to raise your hand and I'll unmute you? Are you with us, Dr. Mazula? Okay, he cannot raise his hand. So, um, so humidification. Uh, patients would often do this, uh, and the, they would have a you know standing humidifier in the bedroom. I always, always thought this was a horrible idea, um, unless they live in the far north regions or in the middle of some massive polar vortex. The humidity levels in the United States are just are fine, they don't need um, the, if there's any humidification in the house, it should be part of a, a, a unit that's attached to the furnace. Um, um, and with a humidistat set at less than 60%. Uh, More than that, you're gonna get um, condensation in the walls, you're gonna get mold developing. It's just, um, now for an acute illness, you know, people feel better <laughs> They go take a steam shower, which is fine, um, but they don't need to turn the whole house into a, a sauna. Um, so that's my my rant on humidifiers. Okay, that, thank if that you. the question. <laughs> uh, we still have five minutes. So are there any other questions or comments? Going once, going twice. 
All right. Well, you just have some uh, kind words in the chat now. Just thank you. Thank yous. And oh, this was such a great talk. So thank you again, Dr. Ray, for your time. Okay. All right. Good talking to you. Thank you.